So good afternoon everyone and uh, welcome to this session. Um, we'll just do a short introduction of um, all the three speakers we are here today um, to keep you engaged for the next one hour. Um, I'm Shalini Kapoor and I'm CTO in uh, IBM. Um, I work in the area of uh, Internet of Things um, and today I, I just want to you know take you all through uh, some of the magic that can be created in Internet of Things um, essentially to so that you know we can discuss that how um, students uh, who are who are you know graduating from school and college uh, can think about these these careers and how how that can change the lives to come so uh, over to Sheena Hello everyone, uh, my name is Sheena. I'm representing IE University, a top international university in Spain. I am the director of our London office and what I'm going to be doing is bringing everything together for the industry perspective, but from the university side. What can we do for our students to make sure that they can succeed and they're happy in, in working in the fields that they choose? Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Pradeep Parmeshwaran. I run the Central Ops team uh, for Uber in India and in the 15 minutes uh, that I will be talking through some of the magic of technology. So, um, this is going to be an interesting session. Um, it's the first time that, you know, I'm not in, not with technologists, but I'm with teachers. So I hope I, I do a good job because I've always been taught. I've never talked to teachers. Um, so um, let's see what, what we have. Um, I want to talk about uh, Internet of Things, like what I mentioned to you about, and uh, uh, so how is it? How is it changing? How is it? Ch how is the landscape changing? I just want to cover that, right? So if we know that you know uh, a, a car is actually not a mechanical component anymore, right? And um, and we are we are we are constantly seeing there is more intelligence which is going in a car. So there is actually 25 gigabytes of data which is generated by the car's electronic component so car is actually an electronics component it's more of a computer than and than an actual mechanical uh, thing that we that we know of um, and there is so much of data there is like uh, you know there are uh, you you say the number and then it multiplies and it it, it quadruples itself the amount of data which is there out uh, being generated by the machines by uh, by our microwaves by our refrigerators by um, uh, by all the appliances in the house um, and 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 see the amount of data you know you, you just you just want to go for a for a five kilometer run but you know there is there is so much of your data about your health, about your heartbeat, about your um, uh, pulse rate, um, how much calories you have burned. So, so there is so much amount of data which is getting generated about you. Now, what happens to this data, right? What is it? What is it? Uh, what is it being used at? So, uh, I'll, I'll not get into the privacy and the personal usage and the security part of it uh, but definitely there are organizations who are changing business models because of this data which is getting generated the models are changing um, the organizations are rethinking the way they sell products um, so um, like you know whirlpool is my customer and whirlpool doesn't want to talk about sell selling washing machines they say that we are going to sell washing cycles um, because a machine can do 500 cycles and that's what a consumer wants to pay for they don't want to pay for a single product right today we have an mrp and we have a washing machine for 30000 why should you pay a washing machine for a uh, for a washing machine for 30000 if it's going to fail in maybe 100 cycles right so so that's that's what consumers are moving towards a lot of things are moving as you want to pay as you as, as you use it right we have got into that um, frame of mind that we want to pay as much as we want to use and data is the is a, is a key there um, so the world is actually running on data and there's a new terminology which people say that data is a new oil right like what we disco discovered oil a lot of years back and everybody was running and who owned the oil was the king uh, and today who owns the data is the king because if you have data about the consumers about your users uh, and and this is not just in consumer segment it's also in the enterprise segment if you're owning the data about your enterprise about your employees about how your machines are doing on a shop floor 
that's the that's that's the place where you know you, you are the king so um it's multiplying it's and and the data industry itself is is a huge dollar multi-million trillion dollar industry in itself so how do we how do we use what do we do with that right how does it affect us it definitely affects us because um of course we need as much of people who can understand data and hence um you know people are changing their careers because um no no more do we need and, and i'm talking from you know my lab i have a lab in bangalore and i'm coming from bangalore today and you know my lab i'm not looking for programmers i'm i'm looking for data scientists because that's that's the place where i think i can give value to my customer my customer is not asking me to give a program or a code uh, which can run my product but they are saying can you give me a model which helps in boiler leak to detect boiler leakage because i have big boilers in my in my factory or or i have a connected car and i want to find out the best route to you know to reach a destination so these are these are these are asks by the industry today which are not serviced by only computer programming so today so as and as and more we see careers coming up they are going to be more in data science and data science is not just computer science right it's economics it's maths it's physics it's there are so many essential principles which are needed to to do all this job so so today i'm going to focus on all that can be done the art of possible and and you know as educators you can link it up to you know how it connects to sciences and how it connects to the statistical models or the maths or the economics that 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 need to be there so um there is a lot of digitization happening in the in the enterprises today and internet of things is a lot about digitization which means um that you analyze the data so you know if i am getting data about this room that it is 25 degree centigrade um i get the data almost every 5 seconds i might get the data every 30 seconds so imagine the amount of feeds that i will get in 24 hours or in a month but then uh, what do i analyze out of it that you know the room is too cold or it's it's comfortable um how can we how can we change it automatically based on what we are feeling right now so those are those are those are things which which is all about digitization where you analyze the data and 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 then you put it all on the cloud so you know we keep hearing about cloud computing cloud computing is all about don't own the server put it on the cloud where all the data is there and and you can use it use it as you know in a pay as you use model so so the entire industry the entire it industry has moved on a pay as you use model nobody wants to buy large enterprise servers and large computers and host their data on that everything is on on the cloud and and as and when you want to use it you know you you pay, you pay for it so organizations are moving towards this but while we are talking this digitization they don't want to end at that right because uh, you can do as much on the data as much is available so if you have one one terabyte of a data you will work on one terabyte of a data but the essential is like the example i took how cold do you feel in this room to, right now or how warm do you feel now this is a sentiment it's not data it's a sentiment which it's right now there in your emotional intelligence but can can we get that out and put it out into a system right so it's it's now maybe one of you is tweeting about it and saying that too cold in the room so you know that that tweet is giving me an idea and can tell me that the room is really cold or maybe uh, one of you you know some of you leave a feedback into the room saying that you know everything was comfortable but the light was too much or you know things were not okay so there is a lot of uh, sentiment analysis there is a lot of emotional intelligence which needs to be captured and and this is a very simple example of a of a of a room the the examples could be um say in a car that you know the cars um, your uh, the way you drive vis-a-vis -vis your child is driving vis-a-vis -vis your spouse is driving can we do a driver behavior analysis and find out who drives the best not a very interesting thing but but yeah it it helps there are a lot of people who find uh, value in this data uh, say your insurance company your insurance company can calculate the premium of your car based on how it has been driven 
rather than just the accidents which have happened or not no accidents which have happened so that's the change in business models which are happening today that the the companies insurance companies they they are they are they are wanting dynamic premium pricing and dynamic pricing model for for automobiles it helps consumers it also helps enterprises imagine an enterprise which is running freight of 100 100 trucks if it knows for each and every truck how each driver is driving at how many stops did he stop and did he did he stop for longer duration than what he was supposed to stop and how much late the goods have reached the destination because of a laziness of a driver or the driver is too sleepy on the on on the on the wheel imagine the amount of efficiencies which can come into the system just because of this data available and how does it happen? It happens through sensors, sensors placed at the right points and someone analyzing that data, right? You can still have sensors and you know that data is garbage in, garbage out, right? You, you do nothing about the data. But um, somebody is analyzing the data and somebody is seeing how can we drive efficiencies into the system. So that's where organizations are moving. They are going towards cognitive computing and cognitive computing is bringing this emotional intelligence bringing this um, sentiment analysis bringing these analyzed things across across machine data across say a feedback across a twitter feed across say a weather data when you build all of them together that's when you move towards a cognitive world and and these these are the things which are being built today into every product the product could be as simple as a refrigerator right so in a refrigerator very very soon we are going to have you you know based on the ingredients okay so this is this is interesting because i i i, I mean as a as a as a woman i find it interesting definitely that based on the ingredients present in the fridge the fridge can tell you this is a recipe and this is a dish you can you can make right so so it's it's exciting we are because we don't have to think about what to make and answer our kids as to you know what what do we make today because we make what we have right and that's that's what is there uh, in the refrigerator sorry you can even do that you can even do that right so you can you can uh, feed the recipe into the fridge uh, of course the other way is round uh, is is always possible um, so so these are these are some of the things which 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 are happening and it's changing the product so imagine the the refrigerator maker whether it's electrolux or whirlpool or you know any of the refrigerator they have to change their product because the consumers are demanding that and they have to cha bring the change down into into that because that will be the differentiator for them when when consumers come to buy so it's it's imperative you you can't you can't escape from it um so a bit about cognitive um you know this is more of a you know science that you know machine learning is done um and and sheena if you can just tell me when 15 minutes are getting getting over so that i because the stories can go on and on um yeah so machine learning is done in a different part of the brain because machine learning is about only data right the data that you get which is which is pure numbers um, artificial intelligence is about connecting all of them together the, the whole network of the data bringing together whereas cognitive is catered by a different part of the brain because that's where when I, what I feel is incorporated and and that's how the products are going to get created how do I feel when I use a microwave oven how do I feel when I get into the home I am down I have worked throughout the day my day was not good can the lighting light up based on you know my mood and can the music start so so it's it's a lot about you know creation of smarter homes smarter devices applications but a lot with a with an emotion with a feeling with an sentiments which have been captured into into the whole thing um, so a cognitive system uh, essentially has three part it it actively learns from the interaction so it's so a cognitive system will not will not be ready on day one 
because it learns from the system it learns from interactions right so i i in the morning what's what's the route i am taking every day it learns from the fact that every day i take that that particular route right so um uh, and then the cognitive system adapts based based on the based on the changes um so what we are doing um, in ibm we are making services and that's where you know i want to bridge to you know what what students need to do over a period of time because we are making services like natural language processing we are making services like machine learning text analytics uh, can we analyze a text and convert into speech or can we do speech to text you know those kind of services have to be have to be created um can we do video analytics and say that you know this is a theft which happened at certain point of time so the entire paradigm is changing and and we need uh people at the cross section not pure computer scientist we don't need them anymore we need people who can you know analyze across across the various various um, uh, um spectrums of 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 sciences so um what i'll do is um i'll uh, I'll, i'll skip this video so that i can talk to you a little bit more about this um there is um so um it it it's a very strange thing that ibm is an i it was always seen as a technology company and this is the first time we made a shift and we acquired the weather company so when you go to weather.com whenever you know you want to see the weather of any city that belongs to ibm now um the reason i'm talking about this is because it's a shift we bought weather company for the data because we realized that if we use this data into into aircrafts into meteorological departments into uh, giving it to say uber and tell them that you know this is why don't you give it to your consumers so we have we open up new spectrums of business for ourselves and that's the reason you know we bought the weather company and and you know it it underscores the point that that weather that the data is the data is 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 the king um some more examples we are we are working a lot with whirlpool and i i took some examples of how we are changing the appliance market um we are working with under armor and you know uh, creating personal assistant for your uh, for your fitness uh, so you'll have sensors in your shoes or 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 in your wearable wearable fitbit kind of device and which kind of measure you need advice is you what you know what you should eat and how much activity you have done we are working with hilton as you know to have automated concierge so you know you get into a hotel and you get into your room um and you can talk you can talk to a to a device and say uh, can you tell me which uh, floor the gym is or how cold is it outside shall i wear a you know a, a jacket or or is it okay if i go go out without a jacket or um, what are what are the shopping areas around it and you're all talking you know to someone in the in the hotel room and all these are things are possible we have already done pilots and these things are available in the market today uh, both in india and, and internationally um and we are working with kone uh, to monitor elevators why why should an elevator go down go down and you're stuck into it right so we are working on monitoring of elevators um with with kone as 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 an elevator so that you know there are less less uh, uh elevators going down and you you feel more comfortable um so um just last two slides um we connect a lot with students and uh, part you know it would really go be good that you know you also encourage uh, students to participate in hackathons um because hackathons are are a very good mechanism for students to get into totally intersectional areas like you know we had uh, one hackathon in which you know that those days pokemon go was was really a big craze and um so you know the 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 hacker kind of you know connected pokemon go to some of the devices and you know did some interesting things so we encourage a lot of uh, students participating because we learn as an enterprise we learn a lot uh, from these hackathons and something new and innovative always comes out um like you know there was a recent hackathon in 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 my kids school uh, and the 11th and 12th graders they they programmed a full uh, you know soccer system about you know predicting that which uh, whether english premier league in the english premier league which which teams are going to win so the whole predictive modeling was the key part and i was so surprised to see that students understand data analytics so so much more at at you know at 11 12th grade levels 
Um, there are a lot of courses available. Feel free. Um, uh, you know, we all know about Coursera, uh, and we also use it very effectively. So, you know, a lot of courses are available for for children to understand Internet of Things, machine analytics, cognitive computing, artificial intelligence. So, you know, just encourage your children to do that. Um, that's going to help them. Um, we have invested in our Watson technology. So, IBM Watson is not just helping solve cancer problems but it is also helping solve text to speech speech to text so you know right from big problems to small problems all we are we are, we are solving using cognitive computing and, and using watson so i'll pause here so that my colleague can can uh, take over from here and uh, tell you some more exciting things so uh, it's uh, always tough to follow uh, a cto from ibm because the kinds of things that IBM is doing. Um, it's fascinating the tech space. So what I'll do in the next 10-15 minutes is try to take one of these examples right, of what technology is doing to disrupt the world for something that I have fully many of you use. So how many Uber users do we have in the room here? Yes, awesome. I'm not taking customer complaints right now. Though I'm, I'm going to hang around after the session so I'm actually around if you need to uh, get any help. I know it's very hard to reach us, so. We try, we try. So um, let me take a few minutes to talk a little bit about um, Uber, <clears throat> both in the context of Globe, but also in the context of India. I think there are some very interesting, interesting things to talk about. Um, I have a nine-year-old and a five-year-old. Um, both of them are asthmatic. Um, both of them have born, you know, born raised in, in Delhi, we live in Gurgaon, um, and it's not fun, right? Uh, I think most people with young kids, you know, we all have, I think there's a nebulizer in pretty much every house, partly because of the issue of pollution and uh, unfortunately Delhi is among the worst in the world. So if you think about Delhi today, uh, 2x the number of cars that we were uh, 10 years back, um, which is not a happy situation. And the other really annoying thing, which is that the cars sit idle for 96% of the time. So imagine, you know, you guys have a private car, you drive or the driver takes you to the office. Many times, India is slightly better because we still try to get more use out of the car, but in most parts of the world, it's a parking lot, right? Um, I don't know what the exact number is, but I think more than 30% of urban spaces are stuck with parking lots. Like, is that the thing that we want as a society? We don't have green spaces, we don't have places for the kids to go play, we don't have so many other productive things that we could do that doesn't work because we don't have space, because it's all taken up by damn cars. Um, this to me was very interesting, right? For us, this is the epitome of a very efficient public market, right? Which is public transportation is fantastic. If you think about New York, it's everywhere, right? There are metros and then there are uh, taxis and buses and everything else. Here's what's still shocking to me. There are 2.7 million cars still that every day come into this small island of Manhattan, despite all of this, which is not, not great, right? I mean, this is, I, I remember a really interesting statement that the mayor of Barcelona made, right? He said, to me, the mark of a developed society is not one where everybody owns a car, right? To me, the, the mark of a developed society is where everybody takes public transport. Because that is the much smarter thing to do and historically we have never had the opportunity to do that. So, when uh, Uber started, <coughs> uh, Travis talks about the story a lot, is that we didn't have any grandiose visions other than the fact that it's pretty cool if you can press a button and get a car. Right? That was it. That was all of what we thought about uh, in 2009 when the service launched. Um, but as the service started to gain traction, you started thinking about what is it that you're trying to build. Um, and this is the example of San Francisco to me, which is fascinating. I think the color coding is a little bit difficult to understand. Um, how many of you all used Uber like three years back when we started? Like two people. How long did it take for you guys to get a car then? A long time, right? Our mission was simple, right? We started off with the mission of saying, can we provide affordable, reliable uh, transportation at the click of a button? Now, three years back, 
people used to say ha gaadi aa rahi hai 20 minute lagenge 20 minutes is fine we are happy to wait for it today cars are available in less than 3 to 4 minutes if it takes 6 minutes people cancel the ride right because the expectation has changed and this is the story everywhere in the world where the system has gotten to a point of reliability where it is a true alternative to quote unquote public transportation still is it the most efficient way of doing business probably not and i'll talk about why this is delhi the map basically talks about 13 14 15 16 where our service was available and to what level of density so the dark areas basically say your service is available in a great way and the lighter areas are where the services are new it starts from the heart and it spreads out but our goal was to make sure that if you create enough network effect which means that there are enough people going from point a to point b and point b to point a you can match them fast and that's kind of what we have in delhi today so every uber car plies 30 people a day roughly right if those 30 people had to be plied by private car service just think about what it would mean in terms of the cost so there's a lot of wasted capital and it would mean a lot in terms of pollution right because you don't have the effects of pulling um and i always think about this for delhi which is how do you get cars off the road right our ultimate aim is to replace private car ownership now india is complex right because private car ownership is still a status symbol in our society we are a low gdp per capita country as that grows up we feel it's one of the status symbols to be able to buy a car thankfully in many other parts of the world the thinking is going in the reverse direction where most people are thinking now at least can i give up my second car over time we hope you know the generation that is in schools today will grow up and say why do i need to own a car uh and india is a little bit away from that by but i hope is this it's an interesting question so out of 1000 people in the us how many people have private cars right roughly 900 in china out of 100 people out of 1000 sorry out of 1000 people 900 people have cars in the us in china that number is 120 that number for india is 30 right if we have 30 cars for every 1000 people and the state of our roads is what it is can you imagine a world if we started to look like china or let alone like the us it is probably the worst answer that that uh, that as adults in society today we are going to create a society that is going to be materially worse off for the next generation and so um we come to this concept of a uh, pool <coughs> to me this is really interesting so if you look at the left side these are both simulations of san francisco as a city the dark lines means there's a lot of traffic and the light lines mean there is very little traffic the left side is if only one person goes in an uber car at one time it still is better than private car but it's not as good as it can be because it still means that the number of trips to carry more people is much more than it should be the right side is the picture if there are more than one person in every ride so if you can have two or three people where they can all share the ride and they are roughly going in the same direction at the same time it dramatically reduces traffic pollution in any city and that's kind of our goal and how do you do this this comes on the back of obviously all the technology stuff that shalini was talking about it requires machine learning it requires artificial intelligence it requires cognitive learning and here's the interesting thing which is to my own uh, shock when i was in um, san francisco in april with our product team a lot of this is being built by 25 year olds it's shocking these are graduates coming out of very high quality schools many of them by the way also have never gone to school right i know that's not a great answer for educators but but they have learned a lot of this leveraging available things like coursera or many other things outside of the domain of traditional learning and it's young people building things that are dramatically changing the world this is a problem that we would have thought as something that's intractable it's unsolvable and we are getting closer and closer to making a real dent uh on the topic so a few interesting stats um this is the number of uh miles traveled on an uber system this is the amount of fuel we 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 save virtually on a uh year to year basis uh by uh pooling 
this is obviously a metric that you know my son knows a lot better than I do, which is uh, awareness is so much higher about the environment in this generation um, uh, in terms of uh, emissions, uh, what we save. And I want to leave you with this image, right? This is the world on the left side today. And our hope is that using technology, we get to a world that looks a little bit like the right side, right? Where we truly give the space back to the people for the things that are truly valuable as opposed to lock it up with things that are mostly unproductive and not particularly helpful. Uh, so that's the last image. Um, I will say this, and Shalini alluded to this, the, the speed at which things are changing, I think is exponentially speeding up every year. It's virtually exponential growth year over year, which means that over the next 20, 30 years, because of all the things that technology is bringing into play, our kids in schools today are going to have incredible opportunity. But the opportunity is not going to be in doing things what, that you and I did when we were growing up. The opportunity is going to be in things that don't exist today, which means that skills like being able to adapt fast, being able to skill yourself and reskill yourself fast, things like uh, learning softer skills much more than harder skills. All of these things will be materially different from the way at least I went to school and learned. So lots of challenges that this world is going to pose uh, along with the opportunities because what's required going forward in my humble view is going to be very very different from what we have seen over the last uh, last 20 years. I, I don't know exactly what the answer to that is but I'm sure as educators this is something that you're grappling with and hopefully we will be able to prepare our children to be positive contributors in this world over the next 15, 20 years. Thank you. Okay, uh, okay, so we've seen that things are changing and really, really quickly. And it's not just industry that's screaming out saying we need new things from our students. It's universities who have to listen to that. It's universities who have to adapt to that and make sure that students have those opportunities. So, as I mentioned, I, I represent an international university in Spain called IE University. We are helping students get education at an undergraduate level, at a postgraduate level, at an executive education level, but also for companies who are in fantastic positions, who are at the top of their market, but when they started, things were so different that they need retraining. So, my story, I, when I was at school, I didn't have a counsellor. I didn't have anybody who could give me any advice as to what I should be studying, what job I should be doing. So the way that I did it was to choose two subjects that I really, really enjoyed, which was Spanish and business. I knew that the world was globalizing. I knew that the whole world was working with the rest of the world. And I knew that business was a great foundation. So I found the top list for schools for business, the top list for schools for languages, matched them across, and I found a university that could offer me both and I studied business and Spanish at university in Leeds. However, if I had have had some help, my situation would have been very, very different. I went to a UK university to learn Spanish. I didn't get the opportunity to speak Spanish every day. I didn't hear it in a country where I was going to the shops and reading patatas instead of potatoes. I didn't get to hear it on the radio. I didn't get immersed in that culture. I went to a UK university where I had two language classes a week and all of my business classes in Spanish. And as my Spanish got better, I had some business classes in Spanish. However, if I had have had a guidance counselor, if I'd have had academics, principals who knew what was changing in the world, somebody who could advise me, Sheena, in five years, Something that doesn't exist right now is going to be so highly demanded, maybe you should train yourself in that field. My choices might have been slightly different. We, at this conference, at the IC3 conference, it's three groups that we're trying to get together. We're trying to get the guidance counsellors, the school academics, the principals, the provosts, everybody who has the opportunity to make all of that available for students to link up with universities who are then changing their educational systems, but also with industry experts who are telling us what they're looking for right now and what they're going to be demanding in the next few years. So how are we going to be able to do this? Well, let's, let's have this conversation. Let's see what we can do to bring all of that together. One thing that IE does to bring that together is we have something that's called an International Advisory Board. So it's made up of 30 industry specialists, lawyers, financial experts, technology experts, educators, NGOs, 
lots and lots and lots of different fields, lots and lots of specialists in these fields, all saying, I'm the one who's going to be hiring students when they come out of, out of university. This is what I want from your students. You need to make that happen so that when they graduate, they are prepared for not when they started their degree program in year one, two, three, but by the time they finish in year four or three or five, depending on the degree that they're studying, they are so, so well equipped that they are not, everything that they learned in the first year is not already out of date. So our international advisory board, we fly them into Madrid once a year and we actively say, what is it that you're looking for on the CVs of the students that we're hiring? And they're the ones who are saying, what you were teaching 10 years ago, get rid of that. You need to come up with a new syllabus every single year. And that's what we're doing at IE. Our syllabus is updated every single year, listening to industry experts telling us this is what we want. Go and change it, teach it, and make sure your guidance counsellors know that this is, this is the opportunities that your students have. What, every single year they give us new information. Every single year they give us new tips. But over the last maybe three or four years, there have been four things that have remained really, really constant. And it'd be really interesting to see if Shalini or, Shalini or, or Pradeep, you, you hear this as well. But the importance of languages in big international companies, if you have clients that are global, if you have branches for your offices that are in different parts of the country, not only need, do you need to know what you're talking about, but you need to possibly be able to do it in different languages as well. So I can do what I can do in business. I can, in, I can do it in Spanish. I can do it in English. I can do it in Gujarati if you wanted me to. But the idea is, even if I go to France, even if I don't know all of the words, I know some of the words. I've got some local cultural in, uh, insight to be able to connect with my clients. The whole world is working with the whole world right now. So being having languages on your CV, three, four, five languages, is what industry experts are asking from us. At IE, we've got over 168 different nationalities represented. And when, when you see, when you walk down a corridor, you will hear Swahili on one side, French on another side, Italian in an, on another corner. But when they meet, they will greet each other the typically Spanish way. Do you know how we greet each other in Spain? We say hola. We do, other, we do something else. Even if you go into a really formal meeting, you might actually be greeted with two kisses. What we don't want our students to do is if they go to another country, kind of say, whoa, you know, you're invading my space. Be aware that depending on the country that you go to, the clients who you're surrounded by, the people who you're working with, they might have a slightly different way of doing things. Having work experience before you even graduate. What we're seeing, especially in the UK, Graduates are looking for new jobs and they're seeing that the, that the offer is asking for students to have maybe one or two years of work, ex work experience by the time they're applying for their first job. That's a really vicious circle. If you're coming out of university and you're looking for your first job and that first job is asking you for a year's worth of work experience, how do you do that? Our industry experts said it's necessary. They want to see that a student's first time in an office is not the very first time that they go and apply for their first job. So now internships, work experience are part of many, many Euro university syllabus systems. Again, that's what industry experts are telling us and that's why we're adapting our system to that, to that uh, plan. Being comfortable in a very international environment. If you are in a classroom in a certain country where you get lots and lots of students who are all the same, coming from the same country, coming from the same background, looking to do a very specific degree program, that's really great for certain industries. But with the way that the world is changing right now, if you are in a classroom um, studying a degree program, but you're doing soft skills with architects and lawyers and information system management students and business students, all are working on one program, you've got so many different opinions that you're hearing that students start to think, well, actually, I wouldn't have thought of that. And I don't have to agree with that, but actually it's good for me to know that maybe when I work on a project, that's something that I need to take care of. So being comfortable, not in, a, not just being around people who are sim uh, similar to you or have the same ideas as you, but understanding that that doesn't work anymore, having one idea and all of you working on the same, the same way. So we call this the integration of knowledge. Many, especially looking at the UK, the UK system, our students who are going to study in the UK, they have to choose 
specific courses. They need to have specific classes at high school to be able to apply for certain degrees at, uh, at an undergraduate level. If they're looking for very theory-focused courses, the UK is perfect. Whereas on the other side, the US, you can spend the whole of the very first year taking subjects from completely different areas, figuring out what you're passionate about, what you're excited about, before you go ahead and choose your major. What, what is it that your students are interested in? You are the closest people to your students. What do you think would suit them? Do you think they'll be happy in a city? Do you think they'll be happy in a smaller town? Do you think that they don't know what they want to study and maybe a, a liberal arts uh, education system will help them? Do they know exactly what they want to do and they want to be very focused from the very beginning and be around people who are very similar to them? You're the ones who know this. This is where you can help your students. Us on the other side, the very European system is a little bit different. In, the, in Europe, we're saying choose a major and once you get there, take different classes in different areas to complement your knowledge. Technology is such a big thing right now. It's in all of our educate, under, undergraduate programs as well as our MBA programs. Our students are not just learning business anymore. They're learning about business analytics and big data. They're learning about cybersecurity and that goes for our law students, that goes for our psychology students, our business students. So again, it's not enough to know just one thing anymore. Another thing that we're seeing as extremely popular is what we call dual degrees. You can study one degree program and you can take a few classes in different areas or you can go ahead and study two four degrees at the same time. Get really in-depth knowledge and be able to look at something from two different angles and find that magic that hasn't, hasn't existed before. One thing that we did is we put biology students in the same classroom as architecture students. We said to them, you've got 10 acres of green space, what do you want to do with it? We took a step back and we saw all of the biology students who go to class every day together, grouped together. All of the architecture students that see each other every single day together, grouped together. If you were, bio if you were a biologist, innately, what would you want to do with 10 acres of green space? What would you want to do with 10, 10 you've got 10 acres of green, green grass, you're a biologist. What, what would you maybe want to do with that? Exactly, we would, they wanted to take specimens, they wanted to have a greenhouse, they wanted to keep it green basically. On the other side of the room, what do you think the architect wants to do? Right, so this is, we kind of expected this would happen but we wanted them to see that this is, this is what's been happening for so long that you go with what you, what you know. We said, just, just take a minute and see who you're stood next to. Are you, are you around anyone who's new, somebody who you don't know? This is when we said, there's one solution that has to come from all of you. You have to work together. So this is when the, the arguments came out. They were saying, you biologists, you never let us build. You act like Greenpeace, you chain yourself to a tree and you don't let, let the architects build. On the other side, we were hearing, well, you know, you never think about the environment. You just keep building and building and building and building and the way that the world is going right now, we really need to take care of our environment. So again, lawyers are taking psychology classes so they can read body language. We've got our business class, business students taking technology classes to make sure that they could do simple things like set up their own websites, but also take data to be able to do what they're doing even better. So this integration of knowledge again is really, really important and it's our industry specialists who are telling us that's important. So we're listening to guidance counsellors. You are the ones who are hearing what students are telling us to do, what they want to do. Um, universities are listening to industry experts to make sure we can offer what and train our students to, to have everything that they need by the time they graduate. But we take it one step further. We have a junior advisory board. So we actually have high school students from different educational systems who are applying to be part of our junior advisory board. They come and tell us, well, in my educational system, nobody, the languages aren't uh, compulsory. Or I really think that I should learn how to set up a, web, web, uh, a website before I go to high school, before I go to university. These are basic things that I should know. These are the students who are telling us, in their opinion, what they think they need for, for industry, what they think they need for their future, what maybe their parents don't have right now that they see as necessary. So students can actually apply to be part of our junior advisory board. 
they get an all-inclusive paid trip to come, in, to come to Madrid and present in front of our International Advisory Board. So 16, 17-year-old students are telling industry experts and sharing their ideas, this is what we think we should be getting, this is what you're telling us you're getting, and we're, and we're, we're the university who's hosting it saying, actually, you know, there's some overlap here. Our International Advisory Board were telling us for years, study in English, learn some Spanish, get some work experience, travel abroad on, on, on exchange, sit in a classroom with lots and lots of different international perspectives, and then go and create something that doesn't exist. Our junior advisory board students said, well, okay, great, I'll do that, but while I'm learning Spanish, can I go and take a technology class in Spanish so I can go work in South America, so I can come back to India and work in an international company where I can go and help out my clients who are based in Spain. So our junior advisory board had very similar ideas to our industry experts. So again, this session, we're here to bring it all together. We've heard from different sides, and we have just a few minutes left in case you want to put any questions to us. What is it that you think your students want to know? What is it that you need to know in terms of industry experts, universities, something that you think that we're not thinking of, something that we need to have more at the forefront of our minds that you're hearing from your students? Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, in, in a European perspective, extremely uh, open to that. Um, industry experts are looking for well-rounded students. They want students who have good grades. They want students who are saying, well, I studied as a legal uh, professional, but I'm also playing sports. I'm also doing charity events and I wanted to do some classes in technology. That kind of profile gets great scholarships. If you want to speak specifically about IE, we can have a, a conversation later on. The Junior Advisory Board, if our students are selected to this, automatically they get an 80% scholarship if they are selected. Is it a time that universities started to evaluate things beyond the grades? Completely. European universities take a very holistic approach, so they do. We have students apply from the same. You are not demanding schools or curriculum like the IE to produce evaluation criteria by which these things are presented. It comes in subjects and grades, and then a reference which has a world shape statement. It's nothing that's there which is... That's, that's, I mean, I think, I think I'm understanding what you're saying, and I think that's very, what I understand to be the very UK system, specific grades in specific subjects to do a specific degree programme, whereas the European perspective is very different. What we're saying is you don't need specific classes to do all of the degree programs, obviously it helps, but now with the way that the world is, for us to be able to teach you before to teach you a degree program, we have to teach you all of the basics. We have to make sure that you're not just getting technology classes or business classes, but you're able to do so many different things and that's that's part of our European system. Our architecture students have an inbuilt business class. They are taught to write their own business plans, they are taught how to go to the bank and ask for a loan. They are there to be able to set up their own business in different fields. Our architecture students are taking law classes, they're taking language classes, they have to, it's not just the grades that we're looking at. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. That's my point. My point is that as schools, we're not doing what we're saying. We are doing
way that things are processing and the time it takes to kill up on the we actually need it to happen. But it's both sides. We've got an international advisory board, we've got a junior advisory board, but we're looking for a council advisory board because we have to get this right as soon as possible. And I think the only way we can do that is speaking to the schools, school, school, talking to the students, speaking to industry, and speaking to those who are setting the exam, setting the syllabus, and making sure that it's all in line. We will continue discussions uh, with all of you as if you would like. Thank you so much.